so uh, yes, my plan for these uh, two lectures today and tomorrow is um, to give you um, basically a viewpoint. It's going to be a bit complementary to what uh, Jane Carnell was talking about and also what uh, Andre Bernick was mentioning uh, in many places of his talk on you know, topological band theory. And uh, I think that the, basically the big trajectory of topological band theory is that it started out um, with you know, homotopy type um, uh, mathematics, meaning that you compute topological invariance from integrals of Barry curvature of, of Barry uh, connections and, and things like that. And then uh, it moved more to uh, discrete topology, discrete objects. And that is, uh, you know, this uh, advent of topological quantum chemistry, where you talk about like putting specific orbitals and then uh, the specific um, uh, Vanier, Vanier orbitals and, and, you know, which week of position they are in, you have finite groups that you deal with and you list uh, uh, these group eigenvalues, build symmetry indicators, that's very discrete. But, uh, you know, we are moving forward with this field and it's kind of, going back in history a little bit um, uh, that, you know, there's kind of a, a, re, a resurgence of this uh, idea of homotopies, like of co continuous invariance or invariance computed from uh, continuous quantities that uh, are able to resolve certain topologies that, uh, that are maybe missed by topological quantum chemistry. And that was, uh, I mean, also a big point of Andre's talk. So um, for these two lectures, I wanted to cover four, uh, uh, four things, uh, and they're written out here. So it's going to be a little bit more, a little bit slower, I guess, than the previous lectures. Um, so I'll write everything on the iPad. Um, but I hope it's kind of giving you a little, you know, filling in maybe some gaps or some underpinnings that, that uh, you know, at the lightning speed sometimes are, are a little bit hard to get. And um, in particular, the uh, the first two uh, uh, points here, which I hope I can cover today, are, are also captured in these uh, lecture notes that I will um, uh, that I write here. So if you want more details, you can look that up there. But they are also the basis for what I want to talk about tomorrow. So um, so bear with me um, for these points. And and tomorrow we go to really more. Um, yeah, more contemporary things like like non-Hermitian topology and and uh, also this distinction between stable and fragile and so on. Okay, so again, if you have questions, type them up. Uh, I'm looking at the Q and A, and and uh, we'll be seeing that. And I guess you know, if not, then I'll be reminded of it. All right. Um, so let's go uh, and talk about Wilson loops. Um, so that's section one. And um, um, the framework, yes. Kitus, I'm afraid that, that we are not seeing what you're writing. Oh, you have yeah, lots. I think the screen is frozen. I think it's frozen, yeah. Can you try to write you something don't? again? I'm Please. writing something, yeah. Mm. I'm, I'm currently writing something, so you don't no. see that? No, no maybe. Okay. Maybe I stop I sharing can... and share again. And yeah, see. let me do that. But previously it worked, right? Uh, so that's strange. Stop okay. Now you see that addition, yeah, but let's see. Do you see that I'm writing something? Now we see it. All right, very good. Then uh, let's um, get rid of this. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, I hope that's now done. It's also interesting that when I do screen sharing, my iPad shows a very different time than what actually the time is, but I don't know. All right. Um, so, um, but now the problem is that I have a very ugly sound on my ear. This is not, we don't, we don't not hear. sustainable, unfortunately. Let me see. Ah, oh, it's gone. Okay, do you you still hear me, right? And I can you say something? I want to make sure I hear you. Yeah, we, we can hear you. Okay, good. Sorry, I mean I don't know. I had just like a really 
something we are done by here. Okay, good. So Wilson loops. So all of what I'm talking about is going to be in the domain of, of band theory. So we are you know, going to have K space available. We have non-interacting systems and we look um, exclusively at, at gapped systems. So, um, so we can always you know, um, rely on, on, on bands and on translation of symmetry so that we have K resolution. Um, and basically, the idea is that we want to go beyond this tenfold way that uh, that Jen mentioned in her talk, and you know, find out how crystal symmetry can you know enrich um, all of this. So, um, to start, really, you know, at the basis, uh, let's start with the basis, and that is you know a Bloch state, uh, which can be written. You know, it depends on momentum and on um, maybe some orbital alpha in the unit cell. And if I write it as a wave function, not as a state, then it also depends on, you know, whatever basis I, I expand it in. So in position basis, for instance. And um, then it can be expanded in uh, local basis functions. So kind of one year functions um, that are these phi's here. And uh, they have, in principle, first of all, the same labels alpha, and they are um, basically characterizing an orbital that is sitting somewhere in a unit cell uh, that is as the unit cell coordinate capital R. And then in that unit cell, you have somewhere the atom, and that sits at the at the position little r alpha because it's the atom with the number alpha or the orbital with number alpha. This is like an orbital index. And um, and then that you know there sits this wave function phi. Yeah, so that's the picture. And that our alpha is often actually kind of neglected, but um, but it's important if you want to um, if you want to compute uh, transport properties or so. Um, so sometimes important to keep that in mind. This this little spatial resolution within the unit cell, and that alpha for the purpose of of our talk is is you know running over n different. Um, uh, orbitals that we have in every unit cell. Okay, and now uh, you know based on this, the Bloch Hamiltonian. Um, just for good measure, let me write it down. Is a matrix that uh, has these indices alpha and beta depends on this momentum k, and is basically just um, uh, integral. You know the uh, expectation value or the of these um, functions. With respect to some Hamiltonian, whatever governs your uh, your electrons, uh, including the lattice potential and everything, uh, that's an operator now. This this h hat, right? All right, and um, and then the Bloch eigenstates um, they are they are written in the band basis now. So this is like from alpha we can go to n the bands, um, and they. Uh, also depend on k and r, and r, and they are some linear combination with, in, with coefficients u, k, and alpha of these uh, phi functions. OK. And we have to sum over alpha here to n. And, uh, and then you know, the Hamiltonian is diagonalized by these, uh, by these u of k, so the, the, the Bloch Hamiltonian u alpha beta of k uh, times u k n beta is some band energy epsilon n um, times u k n alpha. Okay, so much um, uh, for this. Uh, yeah, I should sum over beta. So much for this kind of um, you know theoretical underpinning. And now, how do we define properly this Wilson loop operator, which is going to be the basis for you know most of the topological features that I'll explain in my lecture. I will um, define it sort of properly in a non-abelian, meaning in a multiband situation. And uh, the key for that um, is the uh, non-abelian Berry connection. So the non-abelian Berry connection, I can compute now from this U K, uh, KN. And this is a matrix with indices M and N, and these run only over the occupied bands. Uh, let's say one to capital 
M instead of N, just the occupied ones. It is uh, depending on um, on K again, and uh, is itself a matrix, but also a vector valued quantity because I can I take the derivative with respect to K um, of uh, UKM and uh, N in these two bands. Okay, so now this matrix I can um, basically turn into this Wilson loop operator in the following way. I uh, take um, some path, a loop to be precise, in K space. And um, along this path, I take the exponential path ordered of the integral um, of, this, uh, of this quantity, of this uh, non-abelian barrier connection. Okay. And uh, in principle, I can take any path, but um, you know, it, I'll talk about in a moment about the uh, um, gauge degrees of freedom here. But you know, typically, I want to take a loop so that it doesn't depend on the end. Uh, you know, for instance, on the gauge in the end states. Okay. So, and the path ordering. So this over bar here is necessary because. Um, because this uh, this a of k is a matrix, yeah? so this thing is also an m by m matrix. Okay, now you wonder in what basis is this is this matrix written, and um, this becomes more apparent when we use an alternative representation of this thing, and that's also more useful for a numerical evaluation, um, and that looks like like so. Um, you start from some momentum k zero and take the block state there. And then um, you compute instead of this you know, uh, derivative, because this derivative here is actually numerically uh, basically inaccessible, let's say, because you need to choose a smooth gauge to make sense of that. If, you know, if you want to do this with finite differences and you don't have the same smooth gauge everywhere, um, there's no real meaningful um, uh, way of deducing this. So what you can do instead is you chop up your path in, in many small um, dots, many small points, and, uh, and then take the uh, ki omenta along this path, and you start at some k0 uh, that I already introduced. So let's say there are this i runs from one to, um, i runs from one uh, to capital S. Uh, then the definition of this Wilson loop is um, i equal to one to S. And then um, you actually have the product of projectors um, on these block states. And um, then you close it off with u at k0 in band m in another, potentially another band. And that, um, uh, that is uh, basically you know, what, what now gives you a matrix, this choice of n and m here. There's the question why we cannot choose a smooth uh, gauge. Well, we can in principle, but uh, in a situation with many bands and also in particular with many dimensions, it's just numerically very hard. But one it, you can kind of construct a smooth gauge relatively easily. 2D, it's already challenging in a general many band situation. So it's just a numerical challenge. You just have to run some complicated algorithm that's, I don't know whether for 3D this is really something. Yeah. All right. Thanks for the question. Ah, th I'm done, right? Did I do that correctly? I, I didn't click on answer live before I answered it. Is this a problem? Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's correct. That's perfect. Oh, okay, <laughs> good, thanks. <laughs> All right, so that's how we should uh, compute this in principle. And uh, now you see that this is uh, basis dependent. I mean, dependent on this choice of u of k uh, zero. Um, however, so you would say it's gauge covariant basically. 
yeah, if you do a gauge, gauge transformation at this k zero to the u, the uh, w uh, will you know transform in a gauge covariant way. So you'll have the gauge transformation on the left and the right. Um, now, what is gauge invariant uh, about it? Uh, what's gauge invariant is uh, is uh, the spectrum. Yeah, so that's important, uh, and that's even independent of k zero. That's also important to know. So where that I pick this base point, it doesn't matter. Matter. <clears throat> It, 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 yeah, so that's the question. Uh, does the definition of the Wilson loop require the degeneracy of bands? No, it does not require that they are degenerate. This thing is defined on the uh, full subspace of occupied bands, but we are not really interested where they are in, in energy specifically. There can, however, be degeneracy. So the formalism is, is um, um, you know, is, is still works with degeneracies. So. Yeah, it's just more powerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's not required. Thanks again. Okay. And uh, so now the point that I want to make is that the Wilson loop spectrum um, is uh, related to the spectrum of the uh, position operator projected into the uh, degrees of freedom of the occupied bands projected. So, um, you know, as a spectrum is gauge invariant, so it should carry some physical information. And the point is it does, and uh, will relate it uh, to this uh, spectrum of the uh, position operator. Yes, that's correct, uh, Mikael. Uh, the uh, the K zero independence is just simply because uh, if you look at the full expression and you can kind of cycle through, it's 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 like the trace of a of a product of projectors, including the K zero, and uh, and then the cyclicity of the trace uh, would you know is why um, why this is path, uh, why this is K zero independent. Um, but that's only for closed paths, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, the anonymous attendee will be happy to see why we compute this quantity throughout the rest of the lecture, essentially, but specifically also now. So I'll just be patient, we'll, we'll get there. Um, uh, the eigenstates, um, yes, the eigenstates of the Wilson loop, um, they, they have a, a meaning. They are essentially the Bunge centers um, of the, so if you want to, you, you have Bunge states that I talked about, which are the atomic ones um, from which you build your entire model. But now we talk about the occupied subspace and if I want to represent just this subspace also with a, with a bunch of Vanier functions, so localized wave functions, then uh, these are the eigenstates that can be are related to the eigenstates of these Wilson loops. So that, that's maybe the, yeah, so there's a uh, sense in which these have a, a meaning. Uh, w is a unitary operator. Uh, The gauge invariant quantity is the integral along a particular closed path. Uh, so the gauge invariant quantity is for any chosen path. So the path is not gauge dependent. It's like the eigenstates on these paths that are gauge dependent. So fixing the path, the spectrum is gauge, is gauge invariant. For in your... All right, thanks. Oh, this is really very interactive. Amazing. Let's see how far I get. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about this projected position operator. So, um, so, um, so what is that? So um, the position operator, and for that we look at the specific path. Um, we look at, let's say, for simplicity, a two D system, or let's do the following. 
we have uh, one momentum kx and um, I will look at the path that goes in a parallel this, to this kx but a straight line so that um, the remaining momenta um, vector k are still good quantum numbers. So I can label the path by these vector k quantum numbers. And so note now that all vectors so far I wrote as underline k. So this underline k is kx uh, plus k vector. Yeah. So I was trying to be a bit careful with my notation here. Uh, okay. Unless I forgot the underlines. Um, and uh, and so uh, so now we want to look at such path. So um, we can also uh, look at the now we, and we want to look at the spectrum of the x operator so the one that corresponds to this momentum kx x position operator and we want to project that into the occupied bands and the projector itself can now depend on these other momenta they are still all good quantum numbers in that sense even if i determine the position in x direction the y and z uh, momenta are still uh, good quantum numbers. Okay, so um, the projector is is defined as follows: e k x two pi uh, psi k n um, psi. Oh, see, here is my inconsistency. This should be this k. Okay, so I'm basically taking my block states and I integrate over one k sum of all occupied bands, and that's this projector. And I'm just sandwiching. Um, the x operator is this projector. So this is the operator I'm now interested in, yeah? and this spectrum of this operator. OK. Um, this thing has, um, has eigenfunctions. So let's write the eigenvalue problem of this, uh, op of this operator. So this is p x p minus theta, and it has still good quantum number k. Uh, on some eigenstate psi of k equal to zero. That's the eigenvalue problem. This is the eigenvalue I'm interested in. And um, this here is uh, simply, I can write an ansatz uh, for this wave function, e k x um, f of k and n. Uh, that's basically just a c, uh, element c, some c number to expand the function. And the basis is psi of k and n. Sorry, did the wrong k again. No, that's the right k. Yeah. Uh, yes, right. Okay. So, um, so these are my my Bloch eigenstates. So this is my ansatz for this for this eigenstate of um, of the position operator. And now, um, what I can do is I can just uh, skip the calculation because. Um, it's not so illuminating, um, but I can tell you what the result would be. Um, and the result is uh, the derivative. So of course, the position operator and the derivative along kx um, are you know, related. That's also what, what Jen was already mentioning. Um, and I get now two contributions to this expectation value. Note that I take here the um, this my eigenstate uh, ansatz, and on the left I project on some um, fixed uh, Bloch eigenstate, and then I get um, this form a x the x component of this um, non-abelian uh, Barry connection times f of k and m kx. All right. So uh, OK, very good question for uh, Lorenzo. Um, the position operator as such, we have to be a bit careful um, because I'm slipping the steps. I don't really, I can't really pinpoint where I'm you know, making the uh, approximation. In principle, um, one has to use a regularized position operator, and that would be e to the i uh, x times uh, q, like the smallest um, momentum spacing, or e to the i uh, x over l, 2 pi x over l. Um, 
that is the proper position operator to use on a uh, in on a on a system that is periodic boundary conditions and uh, and the lattice. I'm cheating a little bit by kind of uh, linearly approximating this position operator and uh, writing as this uh, partial k. But a very good point uh, by Lorenzo. So there are some subtleties in this derivation which I'm skipping. Uh, you can go to the lecture notes to to uh, uh, look at them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, uh, yeah, hexagonal Brillouin zone. Uh, you can you can always uh, instead of this guy, um, you know, you can use this. Um, that's not very nice. This as a Brillouin zone, and then, you know you can choose these paths. Yeah. Can you read out loud the? Oh, the sorry. Questions? The other people don't see the question. Okay. How should we choose the path for the Wilson loop calculation in the case, for instance, hexagonal, hexagonal Brillouin zone? Can you comment on that, please? So I can choose it parallel to one of the uh, basis vectors in momentum space. Yeah, one of the reciprocal uh, lattice vectors. Um, so these these paths would be probably useful, or these. It depends on the, uh, you know, it will later relate it to the boundary by boundary correspondence, and it depends on the boundary condition that I impose. So you want the path to be such that the momentum along the boundary is, is a good quantum number still. Okay, thanks, Maya, for reminding me of that. I was always under the impression that everybody sees those questions, but somehow I guess not. Right? It's broadcasted in YouTube too, and I think they don't see the question. Oh, the YouTube body. Oh, all right. I see. Good. Very good. Thanks. Okay, so what we see now is that F piece is kind of not so interesting. It's the one that we we would expect, right? But then uh, there's a part uh, that has to do with this non-abelian Barry connection, and um, essentially uh, when we integrate now both uh, both sides of this equation. What we uh, what we get um, there is uh, w of k that's the integral of this uh, a term um, and we choose say some k zero I mean I could actually I should maybe write here not pi but some um, k x zero um, is equal to e to the i theta of k f k n uh, also at k x zero. So um, so we see that the eigenvalues of the projected position operator, um, uh, if we compare this to the eigenvalue equation of the projected position operator, and those um, of the Wilson loop, the Wilson loop operator again. They are uh, closely related, namely um, as follows: theta, and now I'm giving them uh, also a band label essentially. Uh, if I diagonalize, um, and then uh, that of the position operator gets also a k label and an additional uh, position label x, um, and they are these. Uh, sorry, full sign. They are related to those of the uh, Wilson loop eigenvalues, um, and what I'm claiming is that they are related by a by a, a constant that is uh, is uh, integer number. Um, it goes from one to n, and the reason is the following: Think about the spectrum. So the spectrum of this Wilson loop operator has m eigenvalues, uh, m Wilson loop eigenvalues. And there are, there must be for the position operator, let's say Lx, that's the number of unit cells times m uh, eigenvalues of uh, Pxp. Yeah? And they are related like this. So if I have a system which has many unit cells, so x equal to one, two, three, four, and so forth, then. Um, in each unit cell, I have, uh, oops, 
I wanted to do that. Um, in each unit cell, I have the same spectrum of the Wilson loop eigenvalues repeated as eigenvalues of the projected position operator. And the physical interpretation is that there are Vanier centers in these occupied bands sitting at these, um, at these positions. Yeah. So these uh, theta A of K, they, 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 they range between zero and two pi. And then the full spectrum of the position operator is just repeating that in every unit cell. Okay. So um, we have, uh, we can, you know, look at the bunch of examples here um, to, to exploit this basically. Um, one is the, the, uh, the SSH chain, which you have already seen. And I'm not going to repeat the Hamiltonian for that. Uh, this is kind of probably no now, but you remember there's a, topo, a topological and a trivial phase. And uh, of course it's a little bit yeah, use of language to call this topological, but anyways, in the topological phase, um, the uh, Vanier centers of this chain, they sit in the, um, uh, basically in the middle between unit cells. If um, actually, maybe I should write it. No, I should probably do this the other way around. I should um, think of the box here as the, um, as the unit cell and then say at the topological phase, the one-year center sit right between the unit cells so that you cut one of these one-year centers uh, at the termination of the 1D crystal and that gives you this topological end state. And um, in the trivial case, uh, the one-year centers um, sit uh, right in the uh, in the middle of the unit cell so nothing special happens when you cut the crystal and this corresponds to uh, this loop eigenvalues uh, theta is equal to um, basically pi and here theta is equal to zero yeah? so you would compute this of course there you only need single band formalism because it's just in one um, uh, in one band occupied one occupied band but that's kind of you know the correspondence here and um, another example that we've seen is the churn insulator. And there we, we know that there is the churn number as a topological quantity to uh, characterize it. And um, the churn number we've also seen before, we can write that as trace of a y of k minus uh, partial as a partial k as of the curl of a basically uh, the curl of. Um, this uh, Barry uh, connection um, trace of x of k, and that is now already adapted for the many band version. And um, now, if we choose a gauge, and that can always be done uh, such that this term is equal to zero, then um, what we obtain is um, that you know this whole contribution goes just to the, you know everything comes from the second term, and um, then we can write this as uh, basically um, i over two pi. I guess in the yeah. we can split off the integral between uh, k y and k x. And then we just have ky and then ekx uh, trace over a x of k underscore. And this, however, is nothing but the sum over uh, you know, all these eigenvalues ai um, at ky of the Wilson loops. So what, what we get is the churn number is the winding number, this is kind of the winding number of these Wilson loop eigenvalues. So the churn number is, the, is this uh, uh, winding number of Wilson loop.
eigenvalues. Now there is a question, uh, do the co components of the projected position operator along different direction always commute? What would it mean that we find we can find a basis of functions whose binary centers are well localized along all directions at the same time? That is a very good question, uh, Mikkel. Um, the answer is that they do not always commute, or rather, in general, they do not commute. And uh, that means also that we cannot localize um, necessarily completely, right? You cannot build a sort of a delta function, uh, Vanier function. They always have to spread in certain directions. You can make it in one direction, you can make it uh, better defined, but uh, then at the expense of extending it the other direction. And now this is a very pointed question also to the case of the churn insulator. Actually, uh, the question is not only how much can you I mean, are they perfectly, so they're not perfectly commuting in general, but how localized can you make the wave functions in X and Y? And uh, in general, in, in, in most insulators, in boring insulators, whether they are the most or not is another question. Most, most in, in boring insulators, you can exponentially localize uh, these states simultaneously in, in all directions. If you have a topological, uh, constraint, and here specifically a churn number, you cannot do that. So, um, so, th so that's a very good question. So, um, the um, eigenstates. Uh, uh, I'm going to write that here. So the Vanier states are not exponentially localizable. in all directions simultaneously if uh, c is not equal to zero. We don't, I don't prove that here, but, uh, but um, that is just a statement uh, that is very important for what we'll discuss later on. That this whole, actually it underlies a lot of this topological quantum chemistry. Um, here's another question. Is the expected value of the position operator in one direction gauge invariant? If so, does it correspond to the actual position of the Vanier function? Yes, it is. Um, um, yes, it is. And uh, well, the position of the Vanier function. So if you have a one-dimensional system, then that's an absolute uh, true statement. But if you have a two-dimensional system, you see that it depends still on the perpendicular momentum, what the eigenvalue is. So it's gauge invariant, but you have a range of eigenvalues. So the uh, point where you put the Vanier function is still a little bit arbitrary. So there's no, in a 2D system already, there's no like single place to put it, the Vanier function because, so let's just do this example of the churn insulator now. That's the extreme one. So, um, I say that there's a winding of these eigenvalues, so I should uh, also um, you know, provide that. Um, sorry, this is X. Um, so what, what you find is, um, as you change Ky from zero to two pi is, and you've seen that picture before actually, um, is that this, uh, this one year function winds. And so at every position X, you have, uh, number of crossings that cause of this red line. And this is the unit cell now. So this unit cell one, two, three, that corresponds to the churn number. So, so here, uh, you know, if I draw a line like this, I have one crossing and that corresponds to churn number equal to one, for instance. Yeah? And so you could imagine that there are more lines that are crossing or yeah, right. Um, good, so I hope that is answering this question. Um, next question, can you choose a gauge that makes the first term vanish, but you, can you extend the, wait, what? You can choose a gauge that makes the first term vanish, but can you extend the same gauge over all the Brillouin zone? That is possible, but not, yes, that's possible, yeah. You cannot, um, do that in both directions, but you can always shuffle basically the the the, the non-smoothness either to AX or AY. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Okay, good. So, so this is now what's called spectral flow. Yeah. So there is this shift of the one year position and you see, of course, the spectrum needs to be periodic um, uh, as K advances by two pi. So at the top and the bottom of my drawing, I better have the same uh, spectrum. Yeah, that, that, that's why this is topological. Yeah. All right. Um, before, uh, so for later reference, before I continue, let me just um, add some symmetry constraints for these Wilson loops, because the churn insulator is really the simplest example. It doesn't have any symmetries, but all, all the interesting or no sort of refined, refined systems, they, they all uh, will rely on some uh, spatial symmetries, time reversal symmetry, and so forth. Um, so uh, let me be just brief and list them. So there's time reversal symmetry. And you can ask yourself, what is time reversal symmetry going to do to these um, Wilson loop eigenvalues? So if I have one, um, that for one time reversal symmetry is uh, changing uh, K to minus K. So you would expect a, a minus K here. And uh, it does two more things. It reverses the path and it complex conjugates. And these two things kind of cancel each other in the sense that there's no additional minus here. So this is a plus, yeah? That the path ordering is reversed and there's complex conjugation. There's somewhere an I that kind of, yeah, makes that listen here. Um, also maybe uh, uh, Kramer's uh, pairs uh, uh, are also present in the Wilson loop spectrum. So if you have a system that has Kramer's pairs because T squared is equal to minus one, um, and you compute its Wilson loop that will also have these degeneracies uh, like the Kramer's uh, crossings at uh, time reversal invariant momenta, just to sort of keep that in mind. Uh, now Miguel goes, comes back uh, in the relation to the previous question, can you state that for systems with boring topology in 2D, for example, we can always locate the one year center by computing the Wilson spectrum twice, one for each reciprocal space direction since there are no obstruction. Uh, yes, I, I'd i say uh, that is um, possible, yes. You might still have some wiggling room kind of where you exactly put that Wilson loop, uh, that one year center, but if it's at a high symmetry position, then you should, um, you should, you know, it should be pinned to exactly that position, yeah. All right, time reversal symmetry, then we have inversion or, um, for later reference, I'll also say that this is in 2D uh, uh, C2 symmetry. Um, so what it, uh, uh, what it does is uh, actually quite interesting. The inversion, of course, or it's in two dimension C2, which also reverts both uh, coordinate axes, that reverts the path. So it uh, will go, will set theta to minus theta by this ordering being reversed. And it also, um, inverts the momenta perpendicular to the path. So that's this, it, it will induce some sort of spectral, it's like a particle hole symmetry. So this is like a particle hole symmetry in the Wilson loop spectrum. Yeah, quote unquote. And uh, then sometimes the combination of uh, time reversal with inversion or T times C2, is relevant and you can just combine the two, but since we'll uh, use it uh, hopefully tomorrow, um, I'm just going to uh, make that here too. So it, it's, it's just a mirror symmetry essentially in this, in this uh, sorry, uh, um, not a mirror, like a chiral symmetry in this spectrum. So it sends data to minus data at the same K. Okay, good, enough of that. Um, next physical and physically important thing that I want to uh, teach you about is the, uh, bulk boundary correspondence of these topological systems. So far, we've just talked about the bulk, but of course, you know that boundary states are, are something that's that's everywhere in topology. And, uh, and there is a neat way to see why this spectral flow uh, directly and this uh, property that the Wilson loop is related to the position operator directly tells you if you have uh, non-trivial topology in the bulk, that's 
detected by the Wilson loop spectrum, um, you also find boundary states. And for that, um, so let's say bulk boundary correspondence. For that, we can um, look at the system where in the X direction, we have, uh, we do something to our system, do a domain wall and in the, in the other directions, we leave, the, leave it in peace. So we want to do the following. We want to, uh, we have some Hamiltonian that we are interested in, and uh, we are actually going to uh, flatten this Hamiltonian spectrally so that we don't have to deal with dispersions and so on. Um, so that uh, K flat um, is going to be one minus two times this projector that we know and love, and the projector is the same as above. And, uh, and so we want to define a system where the Hamiltonian on the very left is just a constant, just the identity matrix. So it means that all the states are at some finite energy one. And on the very right, um, we want to use this uh, flattened Hamiltonian of the system that we are interested in. And we want to now show that there are boundary states. So, so the system is basically this kind of part. And now uh, we want to show that there are boundary states. Okay, um, well, that's uh, the premise. And a simple idea is that we use the following interpolation between this situation and one that we know. So we want to define a family of Hamiltonians um, uh, first of all, to define to, 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 to uh, describe the situation, we use the following Hamiltonian. We use some potential V of X that um, describes the situation. I'll define it shortly. Um, so V of X is given by one for X less than zero and minus one for X larger than zero. And you see, uh, quickly check that these two limits that I promised, they are exactly happening. So if it's, um, if it's one, then this P uh, cancels out. And if it's minus one, then they, they add up and you get exactly this flat band Hamiltonian. And, um, and the point is now, uh, uh, we want to deform this interpolated Hamiltonian. And I'm only going to do this Victorially, but we can also, you know, do this with formulas. So um, it, initially, we start off with a v of x uh, that is sharp, like I defined it here. This is v zero, and then um, we can um, go to a situation where we make like a linear slope in the middle, and we raise this uh, these plateaus a little bit. Um, so uh, so in here, uh, this, this V of X uh, becomes like alpha times X or you know, minus alpha times X with some, um, uh, with some slope. And then we go further and eventually um, we um, have just the linear slope. V of X is equal to X. And uh, from what we know already, we can basically infer what the spectrum uh, will be. So um, on the very left side, and I'm, I'm going to draw the spectrum a little bit uh, uh, weirdly now. Um, let, me, let me do it like that. Uh, so we do um, a red side, and then we have, uh, let's say, a yellow side. Um, what is the spectrum on the on the red end. Um, and I mean, we have, if, if we, for instance, uh, look at the churn insulator, oh no, it doesn't matter now for now. What is the spectrum on the, on the red end? On the red end, we have, um, uh, okay, this is, let me put energy this way and K because, um, uh, because I had the K going upwards before. Um, so that is from, minus pi to pi. On the red side, all the states that are at energy plus one, right? So the spectrum will look like this. On the yellow side, 
the spectrum will be such that half of the states are in the uh, upper band and half are in the lower band, right? We have this flat band projected Hamiltonian. So the spectrum will look like this, okay. Now let's go to the other extreme case. What about the very right? I believe uh, I can convince you that also here we know the spectrum. Um, why? Because this is just the position operator, the projected position operator. Yeah? If V of X is, is, is X, uh, the rest is kind of trivial, um, then this spectrum here, we know it. Um, so, the spectrum will look, uh, you know, will have these this binding, and of course, again, it will, um, you know, there's no way to topologically take these uh, these paths apart, right? Um, they they need to be connected because k uh, k is periodic from uh, minus pi to, between minus pi to pi because it's a Brillouin zone, so. Um, so in this process of deforming the potential from a linear slope to the step potential, um, what can happen to this uh, to the spectrum really? We can just squish a bunch of these states together, but the fact that all of the states are connected like a necklace, we cannot change. And so we can infer that the final spectrum that we get here will also have to look like this. Yeah, so there need to be states at the boundary which connect through the entire, you know, the, the, the empty and the occupied band. Yeah, so just it's a kind of a smooth deformation. Um, and, and this deformation cannot uh, break the topological flow, let's say. And and for that reason. Um, we have boundary states. We have to have boundary states. And of course, the example that I uh, uh, that I drew here is the churn insulator. Okay. Um, so uh, this was um, the chapter one of four of my plan. Um, I. I'm, however, happy to stop here uh, because it's a really very natural break. Um, I know I still have like five minutes, but I think it would be a bit of a rush to start the new chapter and I can get to a meaningful end tomorrow as well. Is that okay with our chair or should, I mean, I can also go on for another maybe 15 minutes to get something meaningful, but I think that's, I don't no, know. I think, I think it's okay, Titusa. Um, maybe also in this way, we can spare a couple of other minutes if somebody has any question. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed very much all the questions, by the way. So keep, uh, yeah, keep I, doing I, I, that I, during, the, during the lecture. I think it's, it's really good that I, Helps me also to see that that is uh, some some people are following. Very motivating. All right, good. Then maybe let me just uh, you know uh, wrap up by saying that um, what we've looked at today is the quantity that we can compute for bulk systems. Um, so we have periodic boundary conditions in x and y direction. This is the Wilson loop. Um, it's a gauge invariant. Uh, it has a gauge invariant spectrum. And uh, so it's relatively easy to compute it. Uh, you know, we don't need any smooth gauge or anything like that. And uh, we've basically been relating this quantity that we can compute in the bulk uh, to two different things. One is actually three different things in a way. One is the uh, topological invariance. So we've had the example of the churn number, seeing that, uh, you know, the, the Wilson loop and the churn number are, are in a, or the, the binding of the Wilson loop. So some topological property of the Wilson loop spectrum is in direct correspondence uh, to the churn number. And that's uh, the same for other topological invariants. That's part one. Part two, we saw that the spectrum of the Wilson loop of this quantity to do with topology is uh, very closely related to the spectrum of the uh, projected position operator. And um, the third thing, we use this relation to the real space to position operator 
to actually show that um, there is a topological bulk boundary correspondence. Whenever there is a flow in the Wilson loop spectrum, so that maybe I should sort of say, yeah, right, topological flow in the Wilson loop spectrum, I have a boundary that does not break the symmetry that you know protects this flow. Then I also have to have uh, on this you know even boundary, I have to have topological boundary modes. So now there is another question from Alexandra. Let me first answer this one. Is it easy to see in this interpolation picture that the number of surface states equals the churn number? Yes. So um, yes. So so. Um, as we said before, the churn number is equal to the number of states that tr transverse this um, um, uh, any cut, really any cut. Yeah. Um, of course, there could we have to count, um, you know, with taking the, the the sign of the Fermi velocity into account. So if we have a state that does this, it counts as uh, plus one, minus one, plus one. So the sum is one. So the churn number would be one. Yeah. So there could be these kind of accidental boundary states. Also, Jen was mentioning this quite a lot. Um, but uh, you know, if you kind of count properly, then you, you know that there needs to be, um, a, you know, a single or an odd number of crossings, or maybe, no, a number of crossings. If you count them with sign, that equals the churn number at every energy. But of course, it doesn't tell you whether a state does this here. Or whether you just have one state that's doing doing this over the breathing zone, and that's a non-universal thing. That the, you know, between these two situations, you could go by changing the boundary conditions a little bit. Mm -hmm. Then um, Martin asks: uh, In previous slides, you defined the churn number as the winding of the Wilson loop using a single band example. If we had a non-abelian case, could the winding of some bands cancel the winding? Of the others leading to c equal to zero, despite having winding. So, um, good question. Let me try to uh, to to sketch what you have. So, let's say two bands. That's probably the the simplest case. Um, and again, uh, I, I have this winding. So there's one band. Uh, let's say that does this, or do a bit more. Nah. One band that does this. And from another band, I get, uh, let's say, the opposite winding. Then the point is, yes, there are these two windings. The total churn number would be zero. And now we have to see, this would be a construction if these bands are completely detached. But um, we have to always think of putting every possible perturbation that's symmetry allowed. And such a perturbation would, in general, couple these bands. And then the Wilson loop um, would would basically look like this, and then there's no winding anymore. So um, so what you're saying is right. These bands mutually cancel each other's winding. There's no need you know need for winding anymore in this case. Uh, now, uh, anonymous uh, attendee asks, uh, could you show the connection between the symmetry of the Wilson loop and the churn number in materials? Um, so the churn number, um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure what the question aims at. There are certain constraints that uh, provide you with uh, uh, const or conclusions about the churn number. For instance, uh, if you have inversion symmetry and an odd number of bands have inversion eigenvalue minus one, you are bound to have an odd, uh, or like, yeah, if the, the, the inversion eigenvalues of all bands um, over all high symmetry points, all inversion symmetry points are, are minus one, then the churn number is odd. Um, now seeing that, and I'm, for instance, interpreting the question as to what would happen in such a case, do you have a constraint that relates these two facts? I'm, uh, I'm not sure I can demonstrate that offhand. Um, let me think, if I come up with something nice, I can do that tomorrow. Yeah. 
Okay, I think Oscar has a question. I did I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if um, you were to pick uh, your path for the Wilson loop to be contractible versus non-contractible, do you see a difference? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so on a non-contractable path, I can make these topological statements about the uh, binding um, of the Wilson loop. In a contractable path, you would never have any topological signature, I would say, for definition, because you can pull it together to nothing. And right. then you just have, yeah, uh, unless you have symmetries that, um, yeah, no, no, let me just stop there. Yeah, yeah. So, so that very first loop, you drew, I should be thinking about it as non contractible. As non contract. I mean, you know, yeah, this was just like a general definition of the Wilson loop. So the Wilson loop is well defined right. on any right. closed loop. But, uh, but it's for topological detection of anything, it's absolutely not meaningful. So, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. So, it's important that by straight path is, is a non contractible one. It doesn't need to be straight necessarily, but it should be non contractible for these topological things. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. All right. All right. Very nice. Well, that closed the question session. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's great. I think it's great that there is. Oh, maybe not. Uh, should I take this one last one? Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> all right. Uh, so it's always protected. It's always protected the Wilson loop winding. I believe that you only distinguish the parity of the winding, but not the number. For example, you know that general parity of the winding number, you, don't can, you can't distinguish between C equal to one and three. Um, so this parity thing is for these inversion eigenvalues. The Wilson loop binding for the churn number, for instance, is, is uh, giving you the full information. So in a churn insulator uh, with churn number three, um, you would really, if, if this is like your unit cell, you would have, oh, that's not, I didn't draw that very nicely. You can have, oh, oh let's do two with maybe then I'm not so much in trouble. So you could have this, for instance, that would be, a, Turn number two uh, winding, telling you uh, that's told by by looking at any cut, counting, you know, with a sign how many crossings you have, and that is there's no way to remove that. So it's it's not just the parity; it's the full turn number, and in general the full topological invariance that you would get from that. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Okay, so.